What's up, folks? Anthony Armstrong here, former NFL receiver and host of Believe in Commanders. And with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the Specials League. It's a league specifically created for combo projections that includes two or more players from different sports or leagues. Make your way over to prizepicks.com forward slash believe and use the code believe, that's B-L-E-A-V, for a first deposit match up to $100. You must be present in certain states. Visit prizepicks.com for restrictions and details. Pick more or pick less. It's that easy. Prize Picks. Every team, every topic, everywhere. This is Believe. Ich war seit Wochen auf diesen Tag. Und tanz vor Freude über den Asphalt. Als wär's ein Rhythmus, als gäb's ein Lied, das mich immer weiter durch die Straßen zieht. Komm dir entgegen. Hello and welcome to the Gig Impressing Podcast. My name is Steph Minkowski and today I'm joined by Matt Ford and not Manu Vett. Manu is currently flying uh, high over Iceland right now. That's not uh, a euthanism or a cinema. <laughs> quite literally the case. He's a careful, safe cruising altitude um, on his way back to North America. Um, Matt, we did discuss trying to get him on the show and record this while on his flight. He does have internet. He's capable of WhatsApping us, so he's still pestering us through the show. But I think we agreed that um, him talking about the Bundesliga for four to five minutes with people sitting either side of on the plane was probably not that fair. Oh, I, I don't know. I, mean, I can imagine that the other Lufthansa passengers are probably desperate to hear what Manu's thoughts are uh, on the on, on his Bundesliga weekend, but oh well, they'll have to uh, they'll just have to tune into this afterwards, won't they? Yeah. I mean if they're on a Lufthansa flight from Frankfurt to America, uh chances are they probably know who Manu is and they probably can't follow German football anyway, so they might appreciate it, but yeah, uh, we decide against it. It's just me and you today, uh, and we've got a lot to talk about. Obviously, um, we had the kind of very initial raw reaction uh, mini uh, show from yourself, Manu, and Seb Stafford Bloor, uh, deeps in the depths of the Westfalen Stadion. Um, really enjoyable listen. Uh, I can appreciate how hard it must have been as you guys were kind of veering out of the way of. Uh, <laughs> Fire engines, it would seem. Yeah, um, out the way of fire engines. And also, I think I, I had to listen to it back as well because, with all due respect, I, I missed half of what uh, Seb was um, was saying. Not because I didn't want to hear, but because I was literally sprinting back and forth trying to, um, yeah, get hold of the various press officers to somehow try and get hold of uh, Diogo Pomacano for me, which they eventually did. It, it actually came off in the end. I managed to speak to him, uh, so it, it did work, but it meant that uh, I kept having to run away and leave uh, leave, leave Seb talking to Manu, so I had to listen to it back to hear what he actually said. So, uh, yeah, and it, it was worth it. It was a good. It, it was a, It was enjoyable. Yeah, and, of course, Manu is obviously a freakishly tall man, so it's hard at the best of times to speak to him and hear what either of us are saying <laughs> uh, in a crowded, busy place. Um but we'll dive all into that and, you know, we'll get the reaction, uh, get Matt, uh, Matt's opinions, obviously, for being in the stadium, speak to players afterwards, and we'll also touch on some other games this weekend as well, uh, right after this break. The last of the major sports leagues is off and rolling, and college basketball is ready to go as well. Bet Online remains your top spot for all your live betting action and contests. NFL, college football, UFC, and NHL are all in full swing. Bet Online is your number one source for wagering news, odds, trends, and predictions. All the hoops betting action, along with every sport available at your fingertips, with both desktop and mobile access at any time. Head to Bet Online today and remember to use our promo code Believe B L E A V for your fifty percent welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet Online, where the game starts. Matt, before we get into the result. And maybe break down the you know the tactics and the reaction from the players and coaches. I want to ask you specifically your opinion of what it was like being at the stadium. You know, it's very easy for us to talk about, it, and everyone who watched the game obviously saw what happened on the pitch. But what was your opinion off the pitch in terms of how the fans were? Manu mentioned how after that second goal went in, the stadium went very quiet. Did it feel like a tense atmosphere to you? Did it feel like 
you know, did you think do you think the fans maybe impact on how Dortmund played in that game? Or I mean, you obviously go to the stadium quite a lot, so I'm really interested in what you thought the fans made of the night. Yeah, those those two early goals were very much like a like a bucket of cold water being being thrown. Um yeah, all over all over Rusty Dortmund's team, fans, coaching staff, um, the whole lot. Um, there's actually quite a maybe not maybe not euphoria maybe not too far but there's certainly a, a positive atmosphere before the game. I was at the ground um, very early, earlier than usual even, and um, and I do always try and get there early because I try and I try and pop behind the the yellow wall of the Sud Tribune where I know quite a few people, so I, I like to try and just you know spend half an hour having a having a chat with some of the hardcore supporters, you know. We're, Finding out what what they're all thinking, what the atmosphere's like, hear about the latest away trips, what's gone on, um, and you, I think you get a good impression of uh, of how the club is ticking, and what the general you know the, the feeling is on the ground. So there's a lot of talk going on about uh, Newcastle away. So everyone had stories to tell about that, and obviously that was, as we said before, one of uh, well, Dortmund's best performance of the season. Um, and as a result of that, uh, the whole the whole club, uh, from team to fan base. Uh, and I think even to the media the landscape around the club had, had come back from uh, from Newcastle, really on a on a, on a high. Um, you know, the three three draw at Frankfurt was interpreted as a continuation of that. You know, if anything, perhaps a, a point gained rather than two lost. Certainly, given it was away from home, and you know Frankfurt are shown again this weekend how how good a team they are. Um, so the atmosphere was uh, w- w- was positive. Um, there was a sense that everyone was very much behind. Uh, Edin Terzic, who's a extremely, you know, he remains a very popular figure uh, at the club, um, and yeah, sense of a team on the up and that they can, um, yeah, given that they were unbeaten in the Bundesliga since the last game against Bayern Munich, and um, that they could do something today, and obviously that um, that changed changed very quickly. Um, um, it, it, you could see the frustration on Edin Terzic's face uh, after the first goal, and he, he, it, it did sort of permeate all the way through the stadium this just this collective unspoken feeling of here we go again and it was I mean, such an unnecessary goal to concede as well wasn't it I mean you can concede goals against Bayern Munich in all sorts of manners but effectively a free header from a corner in the third minute sure, surely not um, and that uh, very much very much set the tone for the rest of the evening yeah it was really interesting because in the preview match, uh, sorry, the preview podcast, Manu and I did, we did talk about the way that Terzic seems more comfortable playing with this team, which is, you know, maybe a little more defensive. I keep using the word defensive and pragmatic, but it's almost like they like to keep the ball, they like to try and, um, you know, work it into the opposing box rather than this kind of, you know, gung-ho, gig-impressing style of football. And I did kind of wonder on that show whether playing at home... In this big fixture, um, the fans will almost demand that you know they throw caution to the wind and really have a go at it. Which you know you see that in just about any major club. You know, um, obviously here in Scotland we see that a lot with Celtic and Rangers, where when they're playing at, at home in Europe, they really should be playing defensively against better teams. But the fans demand better. Uh, we saw that with Galatasaray recently against Bayern Munich, where. You know, maybe a more composed performance would have probably allowed them to win that game, but you know the fans demanded, um, you know, full pelt for the full hour. Uh, maybe you can even say the same about Manchester United recently, Matt, where you know the fans expect Man United to dominate, where they maybe have to be a bit more pragmatic these days with the players and the coach they got. And I do kind of wonder if that was the case here, where, you know, as as what well, I was reading Eden Terzic's post-match comments to Sky, and he was saying, you know. We gave the ball away every four or five passes. Uh, every four or five seconds, we lost the ball. We were constantly having to defend counter attacks. We couldn't keep the ball, and I was struck in that kind of opening twenty minutes by just how high Dortmund were playing against Bayern and how often they were just kind of turned over and left chasing their own goal mouths. Um, you know, most of, most evidently through that second goal, where Bayern were given the kind of space to just kind of run right through them from a counter attack. Do you think? Um, the fact that they're playing at home in front of their own fans maybe influenced that a bit, and you know it it, it almost kind of goaded the, the team to push up and really have a go at Bayern. Where you know 
if it was the opposite fixture or it was a Champions League game, they would have probably been sitting much further deeper and maybe have been able to make it harder for Bayern to break them down. And perhaps, but I mean, I, I disagree slightly in that Dortmund even even did that. I think it might have benefited them had they taken that approach and been more um, been been more determined with that sort of approach. Um, and except from the game, the, the, the game I saw, I, I, I don't think if Dortmund were influenced or carried along by expectation from the from from an expectant home crowd to to attack in a more reckless way well i mean i i, I think from a dortmund point of view uh, the fan, fans would probably say well we, we wish they had done because it, it certainly didn't seem like that i thought they seemed extremely slow uh, extremely lethargic um scared in possession um, which led to sloppiness, uh, particularly in the build up to the to the second goal, where dot, where Bayern were then um, able to break, uh, and that 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 lack of pace in the middle was ruthlessly um, exposed. So yeah, I, I sort of wonder if um, if a little bit more of that ruthless and yeah ruthless bite from a Dortmund point of view would actually have done them a lot better. Um, thought it was quite telling. Um, the I mean, and it has been it's been mentioned quite a lot because it was caught on camera. The fact that uh, Schlotterbeck and Upamecano were sharing a bit of a a smile and a joke beforehand, maybe it suggested that Dortmund were going into this game actually too complacently, um, yeah. um, to maybe having believed their own hype too much that they are unbeaten and on a level pegging with with Bayern and. Um, yeah, you're right. I don't. I mean, I don't think it's a particularly good look. Obviously, we don't know the full story of what's gone on there, but it's not a good look to be, uh, you know, sort of smiling at and choking around at the at the first corner when you're meant to be marking someone. Yeah. Um, and particularly when the goal then goes in, so it's not a good look. Um, so I sort of yeah, I I, I suspect that had uh, had Borussia Dortmund taken the more gung ho Galatasaray against Bayern approach. Um, um, it, it might have done them. Um, it might have done them. Done, done them good, but yeah, they they didn't and um, paid the price. Well, you said you had got a chance to speak to McKenna after the game. Did you get a moment to ask him what Schlotterbeck might have said to him at that point? I did. Yeah, and it's, um, it's done the rounds quite a bit. Um, he just said that Schlotterbeck spoke to him and said, "How are you doing? Well, you all right?" And McKenna said he replied, "Yeah, fine. How are you?" And then, uh, then the corner came in, and he bombed past him. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, it's, it seems a bit. It, it seems strange to me. I don't, I'm not sure why you would even engage in that sort of exchange. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know if, if the two know each other. Yeah. Um, yeah, it just seemed odd to me. I mean, I, again, it's not necessarily a, a valid comparison. But if I'm if I'm marking someone at a corner on a Monday night. I, I don't really sort of say hello to them. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, it, it, I don't. I don't know. I'm not a professional footballer. No, it's it's a fair point. It's it is one of those little kind of moments in a game where, like you said, if nothing had come of that corner, people wouldn't have noticed it really. And now that they mm-hmm. have, we go back and I guess retrospectively kind of take note of it. Um, yeah, it, I, I thought it was a really fascinating game in that sense. And you're absolutely right in terms of. Dortmund, it, it felt to me more so than, you know, there's that old argument, you know, we're buying brilliant and we're Dortmund poor and I think for the most part um, without taking anything away from the Bayern performance it felt to me like Dortmund did kind of implode a little bit um, and, you know, I thought there was maybe an interesting comparison to the way that Bayern played Leverkusen at the start of the season where you know, they go ahead from very similar circumstances really where Harry Kane knocks in a free header at the back post and Immediately, everyone thinks, right, here come Bayern, they're going to burst the Leverkusen bubble uh, and they're going to impose themselves. And it felt to me like the difference between Bayern, or sorry, Leverkusen that day and Dortmund on Saturday was that Leverkusen were able to kind of re, um, you know, they were able to kind of reimpose themselves on this game. They were able to still kind of fall back on some strong tactics. They were well drilled, they knew how to play their game. And Despite going a goal behind to Bayern, they just slowly but surely just got back to no, doing what they could do best. And I think Dortmund just didn't really ever seem capable of doing that in this game. There was even a point, I think, in the second half where, you know, I think Adeyemi comes on and for about 60 or 90 seconds, there's no one playing left wing because no one knows where they're supposed to be playing. And 
I think you see Marco Royce kind of barking orders to get someone to move over to the left. Um, and and it, it obviously Terzic changes his entire formation in the second half to try and accommodate for the fact that Bayern keep pushing through the middle of the park. And it's it's these little kind of you know incremental things that obviously get exposed so you know ruthlessly when you know two teams at the top of the game play each other. We see this in the Champions League all the time, where you know a semi final tie can be defined by you know just a moment in time really between a, a super excellent player and just a very good player and that felt like what was happening across the pitch in this game you know I feel like Dorbin's season to date has got a lot going for it you know it's easy to forget that despite losing to Bayern and dropping two points to Frankfurt they're still actually two points better off now than they were last season and you know we talked about unbeaten run and we've given Dortmund a lot of credit for the way that they have, you know, in my opinion, gotten more out of the squad that you than you would probably expect. You know, you look at that back line, it's full of kind of, in my opinion, quite average players. Uh, even the ones who are maybe highly touted, such as Slaughterbeck, are still, in my opinion, very much a work in progress. He's not the finished article by any means. Um, and... You know, I think maybe that works from week to week, but then obviously when they come up against a team like Bayern, um, those small cracks maybe get more exposed. And yes, they were missing big players. You know, maybe Emery Chan and Nemp Chan midfield makes a completely different or offers something completely different to Dortmund if if you know that's their starting midfield rather than Sabisa and Ozchan. Um but it just felt like a game in which Bayern were able to kind of sucker punch them the same way that they did to Leverkusen but unlike Leverkusen who maybe man for man have a better start in 11 and have a player like Florian Wurz who just doesn't seem to get phased by these big moments unlike maybe some of Dortmund's players um, Dortmund just kind of seemed to kind of seed into themselves throughout this match and despite Terza trying to shake things up at half time and make substitutions it didn't feel like they ever got to play their style of football against Bayern I totally agree with the Leverkusen comparison. I think that's um, yeah, I think that's absolutely bang on. Um, and Leverkusen, we'll get on to Leverkusen later when we talk about their game. But they they, they showed again how they um, yeah how how they deal with setbacks um, and how they also have a clear, um, well drilled attacking uh, identity and a set of attacking offensive tactics which they can yeah, which they well they don't fall back on. They simply continue doing it because they. They know exactly what they're doing, and this again brings us back to some of the issues which were raised regarding uh, Borussia Dortmund under Edin Terzic last season, yeah. um, where there were accusations and suggestions that you know the that 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 final difference maker in the final third, you know that that clear attacking philosophy, you know, that, and that is what separates the best from the rest. Um, defending in football is easier than attacking, but um, do you have these you know the the, the well drilled patterns running into a pre-prepared spaces um in order to drag defenders out of um out of position but in a in a pre-drilled way because that's part of your attacking philosophy that that's the hard, I would say that's the hardest thing to coach in 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 modern football and it's the coaches who who demonstrate that attacking philosophy across across Europe and globally who who uh, who who stand out who stand out from those who don't um, and yeah that that yeah those suggestions were raised surrounding Terz this last season um, I think he's maybe taken himself out of the firing line on that uh, on that count this season by by focusing more on having a stable a very stable defence um, and the series of one nil uh, and nil nil um, yeah results that, that they've had this season I think is testimony to that. Um, however, it remains the case that this Dortmund squad is I think yeah play, player for player. Uh, Certainly, uh, yeah, not on the level of Bayer Leverkusen starting eleven. I think I'd probably agree with that. Certainly not on the on the level of Bayern Munich starting eleven, and also certainly not comparable to the quality of Dortmund starting elevens in previous seasons when they've had Haaland, Bellingham, Sancho, yeah. and the like. And even with those players in the team, they didn't. They, they never actually won the. Or they never actually won the league. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it. it I think it all served to you know, come back to that that analogy with the, the the bucket of cold water on the head, maybe just to bring Dortmund down to earth a little bit, just to remind them of where they stand as a club, where they stand as a squad, 
where Edin Terzic stands as a coach, I think he's. I think he. Yeah, I, I've been the first to suggest the the progress he's been making this season. I think it's actually really fascinating to to watch the progress he's making as a coach and you know, making these steps because he's a re- still a relatively young coach in comparatively speaking. But yeah, this uh, that result on, on on Saturday certainly certainly showed. Uh, yeah, brought certainly brought them back down to earth. But um, I think even despite all that, let's not take anything away from. From Bayern, um, I think that'd be remiss to 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 ignore that they were extremely extremely good. Mm. Um, their best performance of the season. They were ruthless. They were um, well drilled. Terzic said himself that they couldn't cope with Bayern's pace and more importantly accuracy of passing. Barely a pass <laughs> went amiss. Yeah. Um, the way I think Seb mentioned it when we were talking in the in the in the mix zone afterwards. And, the, the chaos that Harry Kane causes by dropping into the positions that he does, uh, sometimes as far back as halfway into his own half, and then uh, yeah, he did that in the first minute in the build up to the to the corner that we were talking about. It comes from Harry Kane doing that. He drops deep, controls the ball, and plays in Musiala, and it, it's it's precisely that sort of um, levering Dortmund's defense out of position, which creates that. He, he, and Terzic said before the game that they were going to try and. Um, deal with Kane collectively rather than man marking him. Didn't work. I mean, I'm not sure what the answer is to it. Kane's absolutely unplayable in that far. Levi said, "Hey, I mean, I know he's been on fire all season, but it, that was outstanding on Saturday. An absolute joy to watch. He was fantastic from start to finish, and he's popping up left and right and all over the place." Um, for Konrad Leimer and Leon Goretzka in centre mid for a centre mid partnership, which I don't think had actually started a game together before. They were fantastic and leagues above what Solio's Chan and Marcel Sabitzer had to offer. Um, yeah, you can mention maybe would Emery Chan have made a difference? Not in terms of pace, no. Maybe in terms of experience and positioning, maybe. Um, perhaps there was actually a, a shout to have started Felix Metcher um, in, in, in hindsight. It certainly brings slightly more Bellingham-ish qualities, if I can put it that way. Again, that's not me saying that if he's a match is the next Jude Bellingham, absolutely not. But um certainly has a more sim- more comparable style of play, slightly more um dynamic and a bit more pace in, in midfield. Perhaps that would have helped. Um but yeah, um turned off away from Bayern and I think the reactions from the Bayern camp and especially Thomas Tuchel uh, surrounding the game, I think it showed it all, showed how much anger was um was was yeah was was in the Bayern squad, um, and I think yeah, if you don't mind me just going into it a little bit, it's actually been it's actually quite dramatic. I'm not sure to what extent people outside Germany maybe picked up on Thomas Tuchel's interviews, uh, pre-match and post-match, because he, he he behaved very differently with the German media and with German Sky than he did with some of the English language broadcasters, um, and this all started in the week, obviously caused. I think legitimately perhaps by the defeat to Saarbrücken in the week, obviously. And Thomas Tuchel has made no bones by said there's no excuse for that. I mean, he, he he totally expects and accepts criticism when they get knocked out by a Division Three team. Absolutely fine. Um, however, he, he he took he took issue in particular with comments from Lothar Mateus and uh, Dietmar Hamann, as we former Bayern players themselves, um, who said worse the effect that the the the. the uh, they don't see any further development in this Bayern team under Thomas Tuchel. And uh, he sort of laughed it off in the pre-match press conference on Thursday or Friday, whenever it was. And it, it seemed like a bit of a joke, nothing more, when he was said no no further development. And he responded, oh, well, I don't see any further development from them either. And just laughed it off. And it was like, I think I, I thought as well at the time, well, no more than that. That's just a joke. Fair play. Good little, good little counter. But then pre-match on the pitch in Dortmund he was doing his pre-match interviews to Sky where he kept referring to it and he said well why don't you ask the experts um, I, I, I don't want to t- I don't want to interrupt you when you're talking to your experts because they know and he was like okay this has clearly wound him up and then even post-match uh, well, obviously having won 4-0 he, uh, he feels completely vindicated and um, yeah he's, he was doing an interview with Lothar Mateus saying well go on tell me about the further development and keep discussing it and then he went into, went into the press conference and in the press conferences in Germany, they, the coaches start their press conference by giving a, a quick statement, about a minute or two, of a monologue just describing the game. And Tufel basically said, um, can I quote the experts? Uh, he said, for a team with no further development and with a bad relationship between coach and uh, coach and squad, 
that was okay, wasn't it? And uh, I'll leave the rest to the experts over to you, uh, Edin Terzic. And <laughs> just, just left it at that. So he was clearly wound up and he repeated it on six or seven occasions. Um, so, yeah, just a bit, maybe a bit of an insight into the, yeah, in, into the mentality in the, in the Bayern dressing room this week. They were clearly uh, angry and up for it. And, yeah, that's a, a dangerous combination, clearly. Yeah, I think I think you know obviously Tuchel has a right to respond to those things, but I think it also maybe shows you know you're almost like the lady doth protest too much sort of thing where you know he it's almost you can tell that they've obviously hit a nerve there or he's obviously feeling very quite vulnerable going into the game because there's a big story as well in German uh, in Germany ahead of the game I think it was Kerry Howe reporting that you know. Players are kind of disenfranchised by Tuchel. Many of the first team players don't talk to him. They don't find out they're starting. Um, he doesn't tell them that they're starting. It's other members of the club that speak to the players on his behalf. And the, there was this kind of hierarchy and he, he's got his favourites and things like that. Add to that, as you mentioned, the pundits kind of uh, blowing a lot of hot air around the place. And, you know, you can understand why A why Tuchel would be under pressure because, you know, I think there's a lot of Bayern fans who do seriously question whether the club have progressed in terms of player performances and, uh, you know, the development. I think there's one or two outstanding, um, you know, uh, isolated figures who who are different from that. For example, Leroy Sani has obviously come on leaps and bounds uh, since Tuchel arrived at the club. That's not specific to Tuchel, of course, but he hasn't gone the way of his development, of course. Harry Kane started very well, for example, too, but to lose a cup game and then go into the Der Classic or I think just about any Bayern manager would probably be under pressure to make sure they won that game because, you know, one defeat in, in Munich is a problem but two defeats in a row is just a downright disaster. That's just the way the Bayern Munich are, really. And, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if Tuchel did go into that game thinking, I really need to get a result here or else, you know, I'll be feeling the heat. Um, but then, of course, there's that's one aspect. But also other aspect is probably Tuchel who could probably rightfully say, look, maybe a bit like Terzic is, I'm working with a squad here that has obvious holes in it, has obvious flaws. We didn't get players in the positions that needed filled in the summer. Not entirely sure whose fault that is, maybe Tuchel's fault in particular as well, if he took a more hands-on approach to the transfer policies, but, you know, there's been that issue with number six, right back, um, and maybe even goalkeeper going forward um, that just weren't dealt with at all in the summer. So I can understand Tuchel's concerns there and maybe he would argue that you know he's doing the best that he can with the players that he's got and yeah he certainly did that I want to kind of hone in actually on that midfield because I feel like that's such a fascinating kind of um you know consequence of this this game and that performance Harry Kane absolute outstanding and especially in that second half every time he picked up the ball in that pocket you kind of if you're a Dortmund fan you, you just kind of hold your breath because you know something's about to happen he's about to set someone off to score a goal um, Leroy Sani, in my opinion, is slowly beginning to elevate himself to the level of a, you know, a Ribery or a Robin. And I'm not saying in terms of his legacy or that he's already at that level. I mean, in the sense that the way that Barn used to rely on those players, they could th- throw the ball out wide to them and they would know that they would consistently do something with it. That's the kind of form that Sani has been in for the last kind of six months or so. But that midfield, I feel, was the real kind of. You know, it, it felt to me like the real kind of engine of how Bayern were able to dominate Dortmund, and you know, because because if Bayern have a striker like Harry Kane who can just drop in and become the de facto playmaker, it means they can just have Leimer and Goretzka just being the runners all day every day. The two of them are just quite happy being number eights, box to box players, and. I don't think it was a coincidence that we saw maybe Goretzka's best performance of the season, in my opinion. I'm struggling to remember one like it in, in, in 2023 in general. And it was exactly what you want to see from Goretzka, where he's marauding around the pitch, dominating the ball, off and on the ball, but also somehow making his late runs and, you know, he almost scores an overhead kick, for goodness sake, uh, at one point. So... I think that's really interesting because I did see quite a lot of Bayern fans like you know I, was, I, was, I go on the Reddit forum quite a lot just to kind of see what the kind of pick up the temperature of the Bayern fans and our subscribers as well talking in our chat as well saying you know this that, that partnership worked so well you have to question whether it actually makes sense to bring Kimmich back into the team and take Limer out 
Yeah, I mean, I'm not. I'm not sure if I go quite that far. I totally agree with everything you said and we said earlier that, that that this is where the game was won and lost. Bayern's Bayern's mid, uh, midfield being uh, a couple of leagues above uh, that of Borussia Dortmund. If I can just flesh out uh, a little uh, an argument that, that Seb made or a point that he made a, a, after the game with a bit of evidence, I suppose he talked about how this. He thought it was the, the first time that um, he'd seen Kane operating in proper chemistry. Um, with proper automatisms uh, in this Bayern team, like a, a, a really, really well drilled and well trained and well gelled unit. And one example of that would be that each time Kane did drop back into that midfield uh, or even deeper role to pick up balls, Goretzka would immediately replace him in the number nine position. Effectively, that's how flexible he was. So I thought that was, uh, yeah, I thought that was really good to see. Um, Musiala and uh, Coman did it, it did it on occasion as well. Um, Coman perhaps being slightly forgotten in his performance, but he did he did notch another another assist. And um, when I was speaking to Aubameyang, I think he was sticking up for his uh, for his French colleague. So it was um, a bit of a yeah, a bit of French solidarity. But he he made the point to me as well, saying, oh, "Don't forget Kingsley today as well. He played really really well. Uh, he didn't he didn't get a goal, but he's doing well. So yeah, I think that was a, that was a fair point. And um, <clears throat> yeah, but whether I'd go so far to say. Um, Kimmich has a battle to regain his place midfield. I'm not quite sure about that, as well as Conrad Lima did play. I'm, um, I think Conrad Lima is an absolutely valuable and solid squad player for Bayern Munich. Um, I remember the last time that I was in Munich, admittedly I wasn't there in the work capacity, I was watching uh, I was watching United get absolutely torn apart by them. Um, and uh, yeah, it was Conrad Lima doing the business down the, down, down the wing, which probably says more about United's lack of pace than Conrad Lima, but it, that just shows how how versatile Lima is, and uh, I think that's I think I think that's important. And he, he, again, take nothing away from him uh, on Saturday. He did have a very very good game, and the fact that he can fill in it, uh, at the fullback position as well is is also important. So, um, but yeah, n- not not quite sure if he's keeping Kimmich out of the team just yet, but not a bad option to have. Yeah, absolutely. He has been such a good utility player. I was doing some TV work post match the game, and they asked me about Lima and I kind of said like aside from maybe Harry Kane and Leroy Sané I think he'd probably be Thomas Tuchel's pick for Bayern player of the season right now just because of the yeah. way he's filled in for that team in so many ways and absolutely really... vi- vi- vital for any squad I think and that's, yeah. that's take, take nothing away from it absolutely vital the last of the major sports leagues is off and rolling and college basketball is ready to go as well Bet Online remains your top spot for all your live betting action and contests. NFL, college football, UFC, and NHL are all in full swing. Bet Online is your number one source for wagering news, odds, trends, and predictions. All the hoops betting action, along with every sport available at your fingertips, with both desktop and mobile access at any time. Head to Bet Online today and remember to use our promo code Believe B L E A V for your fifty percent welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet online where the game starts. Anyway, that's probably enough time on that game. Um, and for the sake of Dortmund fans everywhere, we should probably move on to uh, another team who performed just as poorly, if not worse. Uh, Matt, and let's, let's, let's dive into RB Leipzig right now because they lose 2 0 uh, at the weekend to Mainz. A mind side who uh, had very recently uh, departed with Bo Svensson, head coach who'd, who'd resigned early last week. Um, I didn't get a chance to watch this game from the match reports. I have read of it. Uh, it didn't sound like it was a classic. Um, <laughs> an extremely entertaining 90 minutes of football from the stats I can see. Um, it was a kind of... Um, it was a match in which Mind just about did enough to win this game against the poor Leipzig side, but it wasn't just a one-off result because, of course, Leipzig get knocked out of the pole cal a few days before this. And, you know, it's unfortunate that this kind of all gets kind of contextualised around Bayern beating Dortmund because then people start kind of grasping for who's the, who can be challengers. And it doesn't help the Leipzig lose them on the same day. Um, but, you know, that's two defeats there for Leipzig in a row. What do you think has gone wrong there? And... And, and look, if you think it's just a one-off, of course you can say that and say, let's not get carried away. But it felt like a, it felt like a very kind of, um, well, it was a poor performance, no doubt about it, but it felt just so lacklustre. Yeah, they certainly lost away a little bit in the past week. Um, obviously, having having won the cup 
two years in a row, the last thing they would be expecting would be to um to be to be knocked out in the second round away at Wolfsburg. Um and um yeah, away at away at Mites on Saturday there are a lot of changes as well and I wonder if it was I, I wonder if the very fact that Michael Hoser made well, m- made a few changes, p- particularly Baumgartner starting him there in, in, in place of uh, in place of Werner. Um, whether that sort of exposed just how big the wholesale changes were in the squad in summer, I think we were all full of praise for Rosa and how how he'd um, yeah managed to compensate for some high profile departures and um, yeah and, and and really bed in some of his some of his new starters, particularly Xavi Simons and um, and um, Openda obviously as well. Um, but of course, now it seems. But once you do start making a couple of changes to that, perhaps they're not quite yet as bedded in as uh, as perhaps we'd all we'd all assumed. And I don't think that's a I don't think that's a massive criticism either, given how many you know, given the the, the, the calibre and the profile of players that they lost. However, um, yeah, they they were unusually blunt and sloppy going forward against Mainz. Not helped obviously by the fact that Mainz and again. Totally understandably, I think, um, set up in one of the most defensive postures which I've seen of any Bundesliga team this season. Um, and obviously that has that has a lot to do with their own circumstances at the moment. And we'll get onto them in, a, I think, afterwards with the departure, well, with the um, stepping down, the voluntary step, stepping down of uh, of, of, of Bo Svensson. Um, but RB struggled to break them down. I can only really recall... Um, a, a couple of half-hearted Xavi Simons efforts in the in the first half. Uh, um, um, Openda was dragged out wide, probably far more often than he would have than than, than, than he would have liked. Um, I thought Campbell, who took over the armband for this game, was a bit of, uh, was a bit anonymous. Perhaps that was a little bit. Uh, maybe he didn't deal with the responsibility as well as he could. Xavi Schlager, on the other hand, was probably still Abby's best player. Um, typically combative and aggressive presence in midfield um and again i think it's sort of similar to um to to, to lima actually i'm not just saying because they're both austrian but um they, yeah they, they they play such a sort of stabilizing and like combative role in their respective midfields um but they don't necessarily offer um the creativity going forward um which perhaps yeah the likes of an Emil Forsberg or previously a Dominic Schoberschlei um would have offered. Um so yeah, difficult day out for um for, for RB. Um I, I would temper it a little bit. Uh, I think there's no getting away around the fact that it's a, obviously a bad week. I think that's the results speak for themselves. Um but I I was struck by a line in the kicker match report about this game where they, I had to read it twice and three times just to make sure I understood it. When they said, "Yeah, this, uh, you know, just like in previous years, it's another bad defeat against Mainz, and this time it's left them eight points off the top, and once again out of the title race." I thought, I mean, it's twenty-four games to go, yeah, and you know, they're, eight, they're, they're, <laughs> they're eight points behind Bayer Leverkusen, they're six points behind Bayern Munich. I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't write them off um, just yet, as much as it's obviously been a bad week. Yeah, it, it seems a little preemptive to, you know, start um, chiseling Bayern Munich's name into the league title um, just yet, even if it's more than likely, as often the case in German football. Um, I thought the really interesting thing from this, and you're absolutely right, I completely agree with your kind of breakdown of the game, was, um, you know, Schlager after the match saying, look, that's two games in a row we've now played where we've struggled to beat down, beat down, beat a uh, defensive side you know a very kind of defensive kind of you know rigid back line or, or i guess you could say like two banks of um you know four etc cetera, etc cetera. and i think that's a really interesting kind of admission from him because i mean if you look at that kind of lineup that leipzig put out like in the Mainz game um you could argue there's only three attacking players in that entire starting 11 you know you've also got a penda baumgartner and javi simmons but then it's a front it's a three four three and they've got the, the four is obviously David Raab and, and Benjamin Hendricks, who look, of course, the very good fullbacks, wing backs, if if you will. And they've been picking up assists and goals this season, but at the end of the day, they're still defenders. And then obviously Schlager and, and Kevin Campbell are both 
you know, I'd say Campbell's more of a kind of holding number six, and Schlager's obviously a bit, maybe a bit more of a kind of ball winner, who can also play as a you know deep line player as well. Uh, and of course, three central defenders. And I completely agree with you. It, it felt very much like a game in which we did see um, how Leipzig may struggle without the players that they have moved on, because you can completely understand why a Dominic Schobis line in the middle of the park made a difference. Uh, you can completely understand why a Chris Runkunku would have been so crucial in a in this mm. kind of game where space yeah. in the Even opposing so, box yeah. is so yeah. is so small. But also, um, Josko Guardiol, who you know, obviously a defender, but he played such a good playmaking role in this in this in this mm-hmm. Leipzig side, and he was so good at kind of um, you know breaking the lines with really smart passes up to the front line and. So it's almost like back, almost through the entire team, they were missing people who could unlock stubborn defences, which clearly wasn't the case in this game. And I mean, it's a good thing and a bad thing, but I'm really struck by just how quickly Xavi Simmons has become the main man in this Leipzig team. You know, it's it's maybe not a bad thing because he's obviously such an outstanding player and from week to week, he seems to be adamantly determined to do everything he can while he's at Leipzig. And even in this game, you know, um, he had came very close to scoring a couple of times, but it maybe says a lot about just how thin the margins were between Leipzig um, just starting this season in utter chaos because if they hadn't managed to pick him up and you then factor in the fact that Danny Olmo, Danny Olmo's now out as well, you're really struggling to see where anything at all really in terms of creative output in this team is coming from and that's obviously Absolutely. something they're, 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 the, they're the three key absences, aren't they? Obviously, um, Sobosly and Nkunku having moved on and Almo being injured, it's, it's it's a massive, massive hole in there. And then you like the reliance on the Javi Simons, who as outstanding as he's been this uh, so far this season, you probably can't put it all on him. Um, but then to an extent, I also think, yeah, everything is all, it's always a bit of a knife edge with Red Bull, isn't it? And I think maybe that's a bit of a, if you take into context the, the bigger picture, it's almost the nature of the beast. Um, and I think in previous seasons you can look back on a reliance on Timo Werner. I think perhaps before the, the before the, the Chelsea intermezzo, and then in, in in subsequent years a reliance on the genius of Nkunku. Uh, again, players who've moved on, or perhaps in the first season how brilliant Naby Keita was. Again, then moved on. Um, this is very much the nature of the beast. I think um, the they yeah the, the, these players are they're built. Developed and brought through and put in the starting lineup, and it seems to be that ultimately have to put them into the shop window and then move them on and then bring through the next batch. Um, yeah, the latest of which we're now seeing, um, but yeah, which inevitably leads to quite a lot of responsibility being put on the shoulders of relatively young and inexperienced players. Um, and when it comes off, it's fantastic. When it, it, it was fantastic football and it's exhilarating, um, but when it when it doesn't, it exposes some of the gaps in the in the, in the. Yeah, in the system, and I think that was the case. That was the case this week, especially. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, they do have a kind of tricky win- run coming up. They've got a relatively straightforward fixture in the Champions League this week, which we would expect them to win and just about, um, you know, cement their spot in the last sixteen. But they then... are they are away though, aren't they? It's in Belgrade, yeah. which um, I mean, it's absolutely from personal experience not a not an easy place to go, surely. <laughs> Fair point, yeah, fair point, absolutely fair point. Um, I was going to make note of the fact that they then have Freiburg and Wolfsburg coming up after that, which are obviously no pushovers. Um, even if Freiburg did their very best to look like pushovers this weekend, um, and then they have Manchester City in the Champions League. So, you know, it'll, it'll be, it will be interesting to see how Rosa kind of deals with this. You know, I think on the whole, he's done a really good job at Leipzig. I think, uh, you know, look, he's very comfortable there. He knows how the system works. He's probably the best man for the job in terms of dealing with a high turnover of players and, you know, and and also um, integrating the players that arrive from their other kind of um, the sister clubs or um, feeder clubs, if you will. Um, but from match day to match day, that's kind of where he earns his wages, isn't it? He has to kind of figure out a way that, like, I basically lost my three main playmakers and goal scorers in, in, in Kunku, Shobis Line, and of course Daniel Mo injured. And if he can figure a way to kind of get more kind of attacking intent into that team and rather than just relying on Javi Simmons to perform miracles week in, week out, then we could see them drop quite a lot more points against Freiburg and Wolfsburg coming up. Yeah, nevertheless I wouldn't be I, I wouldn't be writing them off with so long to go and particularly with them out of the cup now. Um 
think that that's a yeah a, a slight distraction perhaps out of the way um and yeah um I'd, I'd agree with I'd agree with you regarding Michael Rosa I think um I, I wouldn't I wouldn't be worrying too much despite it being a bad week yeah well let's wrap things up with one final team um do you want to just touch on about... minds briefly given, sorry of given, course I think of that's course. probably worth a mention um it's quite a difficult week for them Bo Spenson stepped down didn't he um voluntarily after the cup defeat away at Hertha um, by all accounts, he um, I was listening to Christian Christian Heidel, the the director of sport, and he said that you know, the the text message was sent by Svensson to to him and uh, sport director Martin Schmidt in Berlin that night, and they sat they apparently they spent quite a few hours in Svensson's hotel room in Berlin before making the decision. And um, if any yeah, if anyone wants to, if you have a look at the 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 video message that Svensson recorded on Mainz's official media channels you can find it on YouTube and whatnot it's very very emotional um he just he said that apparently it wasn't the first time that he'd suggested internally that he just couldn't see how he was going to start you know keep 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 up providing these impulses for the team um and apparently this time there was no more convincing him um and yeah very emotional yeah video two minute message that he that, that he that he published in addressing the Mainz fans um and yeah on on match day there was a lot of support and the chance chance of both Svensson's name I think after the game Jan Sievert who has stepped up as interim coach from the uh, from the second team and took it took he dedicated the gate the, the win to Svensson said it wasn't his win it was Bo Svensson's win um and yeah, some yeah, very understanding comments as well from the general yeah from the general Mainz, um yeah landscape uh, around the club um and yeah I think it's very I think it's quite typical of the way Mainz operate as a as a club I thought it's quite quite refreshing um I think there's a lot of respect for Svensson's decision um understanding and they're still standing behind him. Heidel even said that, you know, I'm sure we'll see Bo Svensson coaching in the Bundesliga, maybe even back with us in Mainz. That's, I think that's the sort of club they are. Um, and I thought that was uh, quite refreshing to see. Also quite um, a quite nice touch, the, the, the way they won the game, particularly in the, the, the way they finally came out their shell a little bit in the second half, having been so defensive in the first half with five at the back. They came out a bit second half and, yeah... Scored particularly the first goal where um, Karim uh, Odisiwo was broken down the uh, broken down the right and crossed. Very very Bo Svensson goal. Um, so I think Jan Sievert has probably got a point when he said he didn't have to change that much. Um, I think we said a couple of weeks ago when we talked about Knight that they weren't weren't necessarily playing that bad. Um, and yeah, they uh, this was very much a Bo Svensson team, which uh, which got a good result uh, despite the fact that Bo Svensson had uh, had had stepped down. So think yeah uh, quite a refreshing way to go about things in Mainz uh, as as always uh, I think they're a good club yeah absolutely I've had the pleasure of interviewing both friends a few times and he's a very nice guy very very modest because it's the last time I spoke to him it shows how, think, how quickly things change it must have been start of last season when he was being linked with a number of jobs in the Premier League because you know uh, he'd got Mainz flying up the table um and you know, and even then, he was very modest. He's like, "Look, this isn't this isn't because of me; it's because of the players and etc. Cetera, etc." Cetera. And they have had a very roller coaster couple of years under him, where, and that's just the nature of mine, I suppose. But um, you know, it's worth mentioning as well that Manu did write a blurb on Mainz in our uh, Monday Bulletin newsletter and talked about Jan Sievert possibly being uh, a potential long term replacement to Bo Svensson. So. I think that'll be definitely an interesting one to um, to keep an eye on and to see whether, you know, that performance was just a case of the players realising that they had to put in a bit more effort for the sake of Bo Svensson kind of falling on his sword or whether uh, that kind of change in management will actually make a difference long term. But, yeah, it's uh, interesting. I think um, after the fact, it wasn't, I think it wasn't quite the assist. I oh, know it was, yeah, from off from the CEO. He, he said that he, he intends to go for a coffee at some point with Svensson in the coming in the coming <laughs> week. Um, I mean, that's how that's how close they all are. And I think he, he owes a lot of his, yeah, I mean, he's been a key player for Mines in recent years. Um, interesting too, I hadn't actually realised until this morning, he's actually stepped down from the Austrian national team, hasn't he? Um, Carry on the CEO. Um, really, really, really. Yeah, decided to, he, he reckons he's too old and his his body can't handle the can't handle the 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 
the rhythm, the week to week rhythm anymore, and he, he needs to he needs the international breaks off, and apparently that has been done. Um, yeah, um, in 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 agreement with uh, Ralf Ranić, and so yeah, that was a little interesting side to him, but really, really, yeah, really good run down the right and good cross for the goal. Typical, typical nights, really. Yeah, it was one of those kind of. I think it was the first goal that was very much one of those kind of great counter attacks where yeah, really Simic good head as well. Yeah, yeah, and, you know, I you could argue that both uh, Lukeba, uh, Lukebo and uh, Simikan are both maybe not making the strongest effort to get back into place, and yeah. ultimately Simikan kind of gets caught completely under the ball. I think he actually slips at one point as well. But great counter attack and goal, and great scenes to see that for for the Minds fans. Um, but I do kind of want to move on to Leverkusen briefly, Matt, mm-hmm. before we wrap things up, just because I know we talked about them last week. Um, but Hoffenheim, they, they travelled to Hoffenheim uh, the weekend. Uh, they went 2 0 up at half time. Uh, disaster struck in the second half. Uh, two goals in two minutes from Hoffenheim. But Xavi Alonso's side still managed to kind of pull the rabbit out of the hat here um, and stay top of the table, pick up three points. We both watched this game, so it's probably worth us just kind of breaking down what happened, what we thought of the performance, and you know, people like like we said about live stakes, maybe not fair to contextualize contextualize all this after what Terra Living games, but people will be looking at what happened to Dortmund at the weekend, and then for neutrals of the league, they'll be placing all their chips on Leverkusen at this point, I suppose. Yeah, um, I mean, there's two. There seems to be two schools of thought coming out of this. Obviously, Hoffenheim 2, Leverkusen 3. And just to go through it quickly, Hoffenheim, Leverkusen go 2 0 up in the first half. Really, really dominant. And it's just, you think, it's same old, same old. Fantastic combinations between uh, Victor Boniface and Florian Wirtz. Um, and another another fantastic finish from Alejandro um, Grimaldo. Um, and you're thinking, yeah, this is uh, Leverkusen strolling to another big win. Um, but then within, yeah, within about five six minutes of the second half, uh, they've conceded two a shocking Lucas for for Desky era. And uh, yeah, suddenly it's and then yeah, then uh, an error on the ball from Granite Jacquem as well, which leads to to uh, uh, so, yeah, suddenly it's two two. And you're thinking, hmm, okay, this this is very very un Leverkusen, and we're not seeing them before. And it's this, yeah. Along with the set piece weakness, which we discussed about in recent weeks, there's another issue that, that they have. Maybe they're not quite the, the finished product that we all thought they were, and they've collapsed a bit here. Um, however, yeah, um, another Grimaldo effort later in the second half. They've you know, they've, they've they've regrouped and, uh, and and managed to get um, a really important win. So, which way do you read it? Do you read it as proof that Leverkusen are nowhere near the finished product yet? Still, lots of things to work on. Or do you read it as yet another quality, yet another string to Leverkusen's bow? Even when they're yeah, even when they're struggling, they recover from setbacks. So, but yeah, how 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 do you read it, Stefan? So, I, I'm tempted to give Leverkusen the credit here, just because I thought they were completely dominant in the first half for the most part, um, and you know they went in at half time, and I was th- I did think. You know, this is a really professional performance. They've come up against a very good Hoffenheim team, and they've managed to really pick them apart. In particular, that Florian Vars goal in the first half, which it's really, it's really, really good. I know we see it every week. Goals, goals involving Florian Wirtz being really good. But yeah, just just watch it. He's so good. Yeah, I know. And I kind of, um, un- I admittedly performed the cardinal sin of comparing him to Lionel Messi and the newsletter <laughs> on Monday. Um, just in the sense that that's that fla- wonderful that's flattering, way... that's flattering Messi that yeah well exactly you know <laughs> it was and it was just the way he glides by players and does those quick one twos and you know Boniface in particular was just the two just have such a great kind of chemistry with one another but I mean it's the second time in as many weeks we've seen Verts just p- pick out or just I mean the goal he scored last weekend was maybe a bit more individual but the way that he just able is able to find space in the box where other players just can't even you know comprehend it. That's what makes me think of Lionel Messi. But I'm not really saying Florian Wirtz is like Lionel Messi, so I don't really think that's fair on anyone. But the way that he's able to play those one twos and the way that he was able to kind of jink by defenders and the goal he scored last week, it's very reminiscent of players like Messi in that regard. And you know. I wrote about him actually for the Monday newsletter and how he's actually averaging like 1.36 uh, 
uh, goals and assists per 90 minutes, which is just bonkers. And, you know, 66 minutes per goal or assist in all competitions. His numbers are just crazy at the moment. They're just absolutely crazy. Um, and you could argue that he's maybe the difference um, between Leverkusen dropping points and being maybe third or fourth right now and still being top. But I think people might look at this game and think, oh, well, you know, Leverkusen just squeezed by by, you know, skin of their teeth or whatever. But I think if you actually look at the nature in which Hoffenheim scored those goals, one was obviously a complete mistake from um, um, from Herdeke. And the other one was just a remarkable shot. I can't remember who actually hit the shot and it hit off the post, but you know, it's a long range Ma- 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 shot. Max Bayer, obviously. He's a... Oh, sorry, of course yeah, it was. Yeah, he's yeah. obviously making a bit of a habit of that this season, yeah, isn't having he? A fan, having um, a fantastic season. Um, and then obviously, Vekhorst taps home uh, the easiest goal they'll score all season. I felt like those two goals were a little out of character of how the game was going on the whole. And then. You know, as we talked about actually in terms of how Leverkusen responded in that Bayern game, they did much the same in this game where Grimaldo eventually, who's been outstanding this season, he's been so, so good, uh, scores an excellent goal when he links up with Boniface as well. So I am tempted to kind of say Leverkusen had this game done and dusted, disaster struck, and then again they showed that capacity to just kind of get their heads down and, and, and pick up the result. And I think that's yeah. something that has been obviously missing from Leipzig. It's something that um, Dortmund weren't really capable of, obviously, against Bayern Munich. Um, and, you know, I think it's all good news for Les and Leverkusen. The only thing that makes me kind of wonder how far this Leverkusen team can go right now is that they haven't yet been struck down by any big injuries. You know, we talked about how Leipzig are struggling with Daniel well, they're, missing. I mean, they're, they're, still, they're still missing Patrick Schick. Um, yeah, but which is. They've, but they've, I mean, they've learned actually, to live without him can, 12 ex- months ex- ago. Exactly. It's an, absent, it's an absentee, <laughs> which I'd actually, I'd actually forgotten about, but he was meant to com- the commentator. I mean, there's no uh, disrespect to Patrick Shea, but the commentator mentioned him in the in the uh, Leverkusen Hoffenheim game and said, yeah, um, I think he said that um, Victor Boniface was really stamping his mark on the starting 11 in place of Patrick Shea. I sort of thought, <laughs> I've completely forgotten that Patrick Shea was there. I mean, this is, Boni- this is Victor Boniface's world. Um, yeah. So. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah he, he, it's, it's right there, for... he's, he's, he's been out for so long. So, yeah. yeah, and it's worth mentioning that he did come back and picked up another injury uh, yeah, last week. Yeah. So it's a real shame, and it looks like he's going to be for a long time, unfortunately. He's just having a hell of a horrible time, and you hope Jeez. he gets back soon. But if you look at that starting 11 uh, that Leverkusen put out um, against Hoffenheim, you've got Herodeki, who hasn't missed a minute of football in the Bundesliga. You've got Kosanu, who's only missed maybe one game, I think, or uh, didn't or didn't play the full 90. Jorthan Ta hasn't missed a minute. Uh, Tapsoba hasn't missed a minute. Grimaldo and Frimpong both played ever-present. Chaka ever-present. Palacios has only missed one half of f- football in the Bundesliga so far this season. Hoffman's played the full-time. Boniface has played the full-time. And Flory Vars only missed one game. I think he was uh, benched after the Europa League game a few weeks ago and then came on and did tremendously well. I think that was a Wolfsburg game. So, long story short, Xabi Alonso has basically been able to play the exact same starting 11 from match day one to where we are now. And the only way I can really see this Leverkusen team beginning to falter is one of these key players picks up a big injury or, you know, a Hoffman, a Flory Vars, a Boniface just completely go off form and there's not really someone in there to to step in for them absolutely um yeah a long way to go and that could still that could still come back to bite them particularly because they're still looking good to progress in the in the europa league and obviously they, they got as far as the semis last season so i'm sure javi alonso will have his eye on that as well to an extent they progressed in the cup as well um, I had a Cologne fan text me over the weekend saying like for god's sake we're going to get relegated and leverkusen are going to win the treble aren't they <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, maybe that says something more about the de- the depressive attitude in Cologne these days than but but yeah, Leverkusen do have that uh, really, really busy schedule to come all season and yeah, like you said, be interested to see how Javier Alonso deals with any potential injury setback. Not that I, not that we um would wish that on any of the players or on or, or on uh, on Alonso and his squad, but it, it, it happens. I think one last little point I'd like to make. Oh, actually, first thought on Alonso, uh, maybe just an aside, but um, Javier Alonso speaks very good German. For someone who's not been in the country that long, um, clearly making rapid progress. He's he's 
He's been doing his press conferences in very, very, very broken German since day one. It's actually been quite frustrating with all due respect to listen to him, but he's been trying. But I was listening to some of his comments uh, to various media outlets um, after Saturday's game, and he's yeah, he's now at the point where he's very, yeah, yeah, holding very competent and yeah, good com- uh, conversations with interviewers. Um, yeah, in uh, in absolutely acceptable German. So I think a nice little aside that shows. Yeah, I think. Probably shows a lot about the mentality of the man, and yeah, clearly uh, quite a quite an, an intelligent operator. And um, and similarly on um, interviews and maturity, uh, another side to Florian Wirtz. Uh, we all know how well, we talked about how brilliant he is as a player on the page, but I actually I was listening to an interview with him yesterday, um, where it was the first time I really listened to him speak um, so much. Really, I don't think he does that many interviews, or maybe I've just missed them. Um, and I thought is as yeah really mature analysis. He sp- he spoke really clearly about those sort of ten fifteen minutes after half time where he said that we clearly lost our grip on the opponents and he was referring to how the um the the distances between Leverkusen defenders and Hoffenheim attackers um had got noticed or what he thought was noticeably bigger, uh, which you know, suddenly gave Hoffenheim a little bit more space. So I thought it was interesting that he yeah. Um, at such a relatively young age that he, he notices that he, he articulates that and is yeah I thought it was a really mature uh, post match analysis from Florian Verts as well so um, yeah really re- yeah some some really interesting developments about our Leverkusen yeah I've definitely got an impression from speaking to people at the club that he has his head kind of screwed on properly which you know it's a bit of a cliche but there are countless examples of players as talented or promised to shine as bright as him one day that do get kind of led astray and it seems as though he's very kind of level-headed his dad seems to help him make his business decisions and his career decisions and you know he's not he he bought he certainly wasn't one chomping the bit to move to uh, Barcelona or Real Madrid as soon as he started playing well for Leverkusen he seems to be taking his time in his development so that's only good news for Leverkusen and the German national team I would say um but yeah Alonso's an interesting one too actually I may I do remember when he was at Bayern Munich as a player the club made a big deal about him le- learning German. Um, I think mm. it was him and Xavi Martinez. And, you know, you saw these press releases about the two of them sitting in a class doing their German classes. And you kind of roll your eyes thinking, yes, okay, bye, we get it. You know, <laughs> everyone has to speak German. It's very typical German football. Only industry in Germany, it seems, where they demand that everyone speaks German anymore. But, That's true, um, actually, yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, I wonder, I, I just, I do just wonder whether, um, this is him just getting back up to speed after also forgetting about it for far, four or five years when he went back to Spain, mm-hmm. uh, or if he has been kind of um, sticking with it and when he was out of the country. But um, I'll I'll actually be at by Leverkusen's next game. I'm off to see them against Union Berlin on Sunday. So ah right, well, we can, we, we can do the podcast together then, can't we? I'll, I'll be there. As yeah, well. we can. So and we'll keep, keep this will be practicing his English as well, and then you can. Um, pick up on my thick Scottish accent. He definitely won't. <laughs> definitely won't be able to understand you. No chance. <laughs> I'm struggling right now. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it'll be a test for him. maybe the biggest test he's had this season. Um, but that's probably a good place to wrap things up, Matt. As we tick over the hour mark. Um, as always, a big thank you for coming on the show. Uh, I know Manu does this week to week to see what social media you're using at the moment, but. Anything you want to plug, uh, feel free to go and do so now. Um, no, nothing. Messages. I mean, if you, if anyone's interested for, I suppose, even even more uh, Dortmund Bayern content. Um, my my piece from from Saturday is is on my on my social media channels on Twitter and Blue Sky. Um, I've based it around my, my chat with uh, Dio Pomacano. Um, came across as a really, really nice lad, really friendly. Um. I think it. I think it obviously helped. I, I don't know how well he speaks um, English or German, but we did the interview in French, and uh, uh, he seemed a lot more comfortable with that. And he, yeah, he, he came across like he came across. Yeah, made a very friendly impression, and um, yeah, some yeah some, some 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 good comments about about the game. So I, I've based my piece around that, and um, I also seem to have upset some uh, some Newcastle fans because of. Um, well, I mean, it's not me that said it, but by all accounts, Borussia Dortmund's travelling support didn't have the best impression of Newcastle. So that's that's sort of, again, don't shoot the messenger. I I like Newcastle as a city personally. Spent a lot of time up there in the past. I think it's great. 
Yeah, well, there we go. So don't How you make friends with alien eight people? The Matt Ford story. <laughs> Make friends with Meccano, but uh, dis and, uh, dis, 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 distance yourself from the entire fan base. I'm sure as a Man United <laughs> fan, you won't lose much sleep over it. I'll survive. Um, yeah, you'll survive, absolutely. Uh, but yeah, that's all we have time for. As always, this show is in association with Bet Online. Uh, and yeah, until next time, thanks very much, and we'll speak to you guys soon. Cheers. Thank you for listening to Believe. You can show support to your host by subscribing to the show and giving us a five-star rating on your preferred platform. Check us out at Believe.com and search for B-L-E-A-V on YouTube.